Hi, this is Shadi and in this video I'm gonna be discussing why Jigoro Kano was iconic for the entire nation of Japan, not just martial arts and jujitsu. Now, uh, if you know a thing or two about judo, you would know that it came from old jujitsu and the uh, ancient wisdom or traditional wisdom or the uh, traditional narrative is that uh, Jigoro Kano took uh, jujitsu techniques and uh, he stripped out all the stuff that needed strength and excessive violence like biting and the eye gouging and the use of traditional weapons like spears etc or scythe or the chains and thus judo was born that is somewhat true but that's just scratching the surface in my opinion uh, there's a lot of complexity when it comes to Japanese Jiu-Jitsu. You had so many styles, so many schools, Koryu, Gendai, etc. Um, I'm going to be discussing this uh, in a separate video. The real reason or the real difference between uh, Judo and Japanese Jiu-Jitsu. And I'm going to go into the details of the technicalities. But today, for the sake of arguments, uh, I'm just going to say that... Uh, all the judo techniques were found in the old Koryu and Japanese Jiu-Jitsu schools. So, what's the difference? Why is Kano so iconic? Uh, it is simple. It's in the terms of who he is. And also, you need to study the political climate of that era. And specifically, what was happening to Japan at that time. So, uh, if you don't know or uh, you are not aware that... Uh, at the time Jigoro Kano was born and grew up, um, Japan was going through a reform, it was going through a restoration. Uh, Commander Perry came to Japan on the shores and started blasting his cannon to display power and that truly woke up the Japanese that they were far too behind when it came to compare with the Western world and thus they had to really go in and try to modernize in order to compete with the West and they just didn't want to fall behind they had their uh, pride they had their self-respect and thus they pushed with all their might in order not to become another colony so just imagine uh, Japan at the time you woke up that suddenly you were hundreds of years uh, behind from your uh, Western counterpart and every nation around you is a colony for the West because they were so behind and that's gonna affect you for generations and generations to come for example I'll give you an example who has the better economy today in 2020 is it Japan or countries like Thailand or uh, Vietnam the answer is simple and that is Japan uh, with the technology the economy and the quality of life uh, etc so why is that? It's that because they fought with all their might to not become a colony or just uh, someone that had influence from a bigger country like uh, USA or the UK or some European country like France. Um, so they had to modernize and they had to modernize quick and uh, it was very tiring for the people of Japan and thus the diaspora happened to Brazil and Hawaii mainly. So. Uh, to take this all into consideration, you had uh, Japan that was eager to show that it can compete with the West and also they were uh, as progressive as the West and not just uh, traditional and stuck in the uh, 16 and 17 hundreds. So why is Jigoro Kano important in all of this? Well, it's simple. If you take uh, Jigoro Kano as his background in education and as a person, first of all, he came from uh, nobility so he was born into a uh, very comfortable family uh, they had a sake brewing business and also he went to college to study economics and aesthetics uh, so he was a very highly intellectual man and also he was a man that came from nobility so again why is this so special 
I recently uh, did a video talking about him as an educator and I was talking about 1882, the same year that the Kodokan was founded, but to talk about how he became a teacher and later on he became a high school principal and later on he became a university principal, uh, I'm sorry, a university professor uh, and then he also became an ambassador for sports, bringing sports like tennis, football, uh, baseball to Japan and tried to put Japan on the world stage or on the world map when it came to sports and also creating federations of the sports in Japan. So, and also representing Japan when it came to lighting the torch in the Olympic Games. So he was really, really trying to push Japan, uh, not just on the uh, sports stage, but everything else. And that's why his search to fame was uh, imminent or uh, just uh, evident because he was trying to, first of all, show that Japan can compete uh, with the rest of the world when it came to sports and also education. So the fact that he was an educator and a sports ambassador, nothing to do with being a martial artist, is what put his uh, school as a result, the Kodokan uh, in the mainstream and also uh, favored by the Japanese people. For example, uh, the Totsuka, uh, Yoshinryu and Kodokan rivalry was very much iconic in the uh, putting Judo and the Kodokan in the mainstream. Why? So we have the police records that barely states anything about this rivalry. We have uh, Dojo Yaburi accounts of Saigo and uh, uh, Yokoyama talking about the fa facing the uh, Totsuka Yoshinryu uh, Jiu-Jitsu practitioners and not the police but uh, it says that uh, Mishima or the uh, chief police of the Tokyo Police Academy was very much progressive and it he was very much uh, for the Kodokan and thus favoring the Kodokan so the fact that with his philosophy of, uh, you know, being an educated person, being a progressive, being uh, highly intellectual in terms of morality, intellectuality, and also physical education, uh, people or the Japanese people, the police, uh, favored Kano over all jujitsu schools. I'm not saying... Uh, you know, it disappeared or they weren't good, etc. The Jiu-Jitsu school were still very much alive and still pretty much performing. For example, you had the diaspora of uh, Yukiotani and Taro Miyake to the west spreading Jiu-Jitsu. And it was very much techniques like the, the stuff we see in Kodokan Judo, like the Ashiharai, uh, Hanegoshi, Morote Seoenage, the armbar, the cross choke. Same with Sadakazu Uyenishi. I'm sure you opened the PDFs that I uh, linked in those videos and you saw that they were all uh, judo techniques. So what's the difference? So, like I said, the fact that he was a progressive, the fact that he tried to put Japan uh, on the world stage in sports and also being an ambassador of the sports in the Olympics for Japan is what tr truly launched him into the mainstream. So. The fact that he was an educator is what put the Kodokan in front. Yes, they proved themselves in competitions against the Fosen Ryu, the uh, Takeno Uchi Ryu, uh, Fosen Ryu, and uh, the Totsuka Yoshin Ryu. All these challenges that happened either in the Kodokan or the police academies with Tanabe and having to beat him and developing the Neiwaza by uh, Isogai and also and the stuff that happened at the Butoku Kai, the Kodokan indeed proved themselves to be the superior school, but what, what launched him into worldwide recognition and stardom, it was who Kano was an intellectual. First of all, I would, I'm gonna ask you something and you please be completely objective with me. Who would you uh, choose to represent you or who would you side with? A man that is uh, intellectual, had a college education, uh, concerned with morality and concerned with uh, being a progressive and putting your nation on the world stage and also, and in itself that is a way of challenging the West or 
you would side with an old practice that's now uh, associated with uh, retired samurais who now turned into thugs like all jujitsu. I'm not saying they were all thugs, obviously, but retired samurais that have nothing to do. Uh, they were going around bullying people, etc. But I'm not saying people like uh, Sadakazu Uyenishi, Taro Miyake, Yukio Tani were bullies. Obviously not, but uh, the practice, Jujutsu, back then, the old Koryu were associated with them. But Kano, with you know the education part and believing in these three types of education, uh, associating it with the practice of martial art is what truly uh, made the Japanese people side with him. Now, this is just me th theorizing these things, but if you connect all the dots, connect all the stuff that were happening back then and how uh, proud the Japanese people were and they were doing everything to not become a colony or just... Uh, something inferior to the West and them being just a very small island. So militarily speaking, they can easily be, uh, you know, surrounded, sieged and just obliterated. But regardless, they still developed uh, a good army. I'm not saying, obviously they did some things that were not approved of. You know, the stuff you hear about Nanking, etc. It's just atrocious. And that was an overreaction in order to not become... Uh, you know, bullied or colonized, etc. For example, the Tokyo trials that happened after the Second World War, uh, it was to uh, put uh, accountability to their actions. And uh, the Japanese argument was mainly this. Uh, we did this, we went uh, into neighboring countries, we took resources, etc. Uh, first of all, to not lose to the West that was also doing the same thing. Uh, colonizing like Vietnam, Thailand, uh, Cambodia, so on and so forth. So uh, you're basically doing the same. Uh, it's not just us, etc. And, you know, personally, I would agree it was a bunch of criminals uh, prosecuting other criminals. So uh, that's how desperate and that's how, you know, well, desperate they were to just not become a colony because that's how much pride they had and also that's how much will they had uh, they had to compete with the West. Now, obviously, that doesn't justify their actions. I'm talking about the Imperial Army, but I'm talking about uh, the state of mind of the Japanese people. So you had a man that was very much, like I said, concerned with morality, concerned with education, uh, and also concerned with putting the Japanese people on the world map and the world stage uh, in terms of education. Like I said, he was a high school teacher and principal, and also he was concerned in showing how athletic and strong they are as a people. And that's what launched him and made him an icon for the Japanese people because he truly represented what they wanted to be and what they aspired to be as a people. He was a small man, like uh, the small island of Japan compared to the West, but still with his intellect, with his technique, he could take out and he can compete with bigger, uh, better opponents like the West. And that's why, in my opinion, Jigoro Kano is an icon and his Kodokan school was launched into the mainstream. It's because of the intellectual aspect that uh, very people... Uh, talk about or know about for example he became a high school principal in 1882 and founded schools uh, the same year that he founded the, the Kodokan. Judokas talk about 1882 of the Kodokan etc but that's not what happened what was happening behind the scenes uh, of Jigoro Kano working in the academic field and uh, the athletic field is what truly helped the Kodokan uh, surge into you know, being famous and also being an effective school for education and athleticism and also martial arts. And at the same time, you had the uh, the judokas proving themselves in the challenges. Combine all these things and that's why you have such an icon like Jigoro Kano. It's not just that uh, his school was better in terms of challenges. That's just also scratching the surface, like saying they took out all the violent uh, techniques and uh, 
the stuff that they did in the battles etc now keep in mind all these things like biting spears etc were already gone uh, generations before that because japan was already united under the shogunate of the edo period and stuff like biting etc were all out of the challenges competitions were still being made but it was kept clean it was jujitsu schools you know competing against each other but the kodokan like i said proved himself on so many aspects not just the challenges and that's why jigoro kano is an icon for the japanese people because he represented what they truly wanted to be and what they aspired to be compared to what was happening to them at that time with the reform and the west constantly uh, at their doorstep uh, but like i said you know that doesn't uh, justify what they did in nanking in china in neighboring countries etc uh, this was just like you know like i said me after doing all these research after doing all this reading uh, you start to connect the dots and this is the beauty of history history is not just um you know they built this house in this uh, year and you write it in the exam like in architecture school and then you get a good grade in architecture school when i was back then uh, i had a total of six history courses two history of arts and four history of architecture and they were all discussions dissertations you talk into context of the uh, castles and uh, buildings that were built and what year but in order to get a point across not just to say what year it was built and thus you know getting a good grade it was always a discussion uh, you know and this is the beauty of history you know we discuss uh, we show things that we are not able to see to each other and create a, a far clearer image and get closer to the truth and you know talking about the tokyo trials uh, the reform the restoration etc you connect the dots and see why kano was such an important man for the japanese people at that time uh, and it's because all of the aspect that i talked about the education morality and martial arts not just that his school was just simply superior that's just a shallow assessment in my opinion uh, i was under the impression that it was that his school proved itself but it's just so much more uh, if you dig into the life of Jigoro Kano. Even judokas don't know that he was a high school teacher, uh, etc. And, you know, trying to bring sports like baseball and football into Japan. They don't even know that. You'd really have to dig in deep in order to find these things and discuss them. And that's why he is an icon for that era in time and for Japan as a, as a nation, not just... For martial arts i hope you enjoyed this discussion uh, if you have differing opinions you know you are welcome to do that in the uh, comment section keep it civil i beg you uh, i appreciate all your comments uh, and lately the channel has been growing a lot and i'm very much uh, grateful for it this was shady and thank you for listening